that this is not a new idea. The, the idea of creating an east-west highway across the middle of Maine um, or somewhere across the state has been around for 70 years. Uh, it goes back to the really the beginning of the interstate highway system. At last year, uh, Maine uh, Senator Doug Thomas sponsored a bill to appropriate $300,000 to do a feasibility study for this idea of creating a, an east-west highway. Um, actually, it's not just a feasibility study that you might think it's going to look at what would be the impacts of this. That's not the kind of study it is. It's actually an investment grade financial study which is intended to justify the project. So um, we'll talk about this more, but think about the fact that 300,000 of your tax dollars have been authorized for um, a study of a private project. There have been a lot of different routes proposed. All of those contemplated essentially upgrading existing public highways. Um, this time it's different. Um, the current proposal is for a four-lane gated limited access, limited access toll superhighway. It would be it would run 220 miles approximately from Callis on the New Brunswick border to Coburn Gore on the Quebec border, um, going through what um, Peter Vicu of Chimbro has called the hollow middle of Maine. The people who live there might contest that, but um, on the east end it would follow largely follow the existing uh, paper company road called the Stud Mill Road, which is a 2,000-foot right-of-way, and then cross the Penobscot River, and uh, from there it would be, they say, it would be a 500-foot right-of-way. Um, it's not just a highway. Uh, if you look at this image, which is from the website that um, uh, Peter Vigu and Jimbro put up, uh, it's called a Transportation Utility Communications Corridor. Uh, it's described as the Northeast Trade Gateway, which is considered or contemplated to be part of the larger Atlantica uh, Regional Free Trade Plan for this part of the world. And I'll show you some maps. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the promoters would like to have it be a private highway is so that they can skirt the existing main public road limits for truck traffic. Uh, in Canada, you can put heavier trucks on the road. They want to be able to put that through on this private highway in Maine. Um, it has six interchanges, and I'll show you a map where those are. Uh, the cost would be over $2 billion, and as I mentioned, um, $300,000 has already been authorized for a study for this, although the study hasn't happened, and I'll explain why. Uh, so there'd be a limited number of places. Think of the main turnpike and the, the number, you know what it looks like when you have a, a state highway intersecting the main turnpike. Same idea here. Um, very limited access. So who's really behind this idea? Uh, I'm going to show you four of the principles. Um, first and foremost is uh, Peter Vigu. Uh, for years, uh, Peter Vigu, who's the, who's the CEO of Chinbro Corporation, um, has dreamed of creating an east-to-west highway transportation utility communications corridor across Maine's midsection. Uh, in 2009, he toyed with the idea of running for governor. Daryl Brown, uh, for 36 years, Daryl Brown ran a land use development consulting uh, business in Maine. In 2010, he was appointed the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection by Governor LePage. Um, however, he was soon, a few months after that, he was forced out of that office um, because it was discovered that he had a conflict of interest between um, his land use consulting firm and the casino that was being permitted and built in, in Oxford um, because he had done work for that and the law doesn't allow that. He was made the head of the state planning office by Governor LePage uh, with the mission to dismantle the state planning office, um, which he did last year and then uh, he left state government and joined uh, Chinbro Corporation as the program manager for the East-West Highway Corridor Project. Uh, Doug Thomas is a state senator. He, he was a Maine state representative from 2004 to 2010, uh, and then he's been in the Maine Senate since then. Uh, he's the one who sponsored the bill last year to spend $300,000 
for, a pub, for the study, a public study of the private east-west highway. Um, Governor LePage uh, happily signed that bill. Uh, however, six months ago today, uh, Senator Thomas asked uh, the governor to put the study on hold, um, which he did because he was getting a lot of pushback from property owners, uh, constituents in his Senate district, and mostly because the, uh, the other guy running against him for his Senate seat had made this a big issue in the, in the campaign last fall. And then uh, finally, uh, Governor LePage, Paul LePage, um, as you probably know, he's been governor of Maine since 2011. Uh, before that, he was the mayor of Waterville and the manager of Barden's salvage stores since 1996. Before that, he worked for um, forestry companies in Canada and Maine and as a consultant. And um, uh, at the signing of the East-West Highway Study Bill, um, Governor LePage said, quote, this is another example of moving Maine forward, putting people to work with innovative ways of financing through public and private partnerships. Um, so he's behind this. Um, he supports this. Concerns about the impacts that this could have on, on recreation and conservation lands, on many of our waterways, uh, the environmental impacts of building a superhighway, uh, the impacts on wildlife, uh, on forests and farms and a lot of the traditional uses in that part of the state. Last summer, uh, I went searching for a list of significant conservation recreation lands that the proposed east-west highway corridor might have an impact on. I couldn't find one. Um, I, was, I was astounded that somebody is promoting a $2 billion project and they haven't even told us about anything about the impacts that it might have on the conservation lands, which by the way, we have spent in the last, um, let's say about 14 years now, 15 years, most people don't realize, we have spent in Maine over $280 million on conservation, land conservation projects. And that doesn't even count a lot of the local ones. That is tens of millions of your federal tax dollars millions of your state tax dollars or bond tax dollars and tens of millions more of private philanthropic money to buy lands and easements. Um, and the East-West Highway corridor would come perilously close to a lot of those areas that we've spent a lot of money to protect. The, the, the project has been referred to as sometimes as a public-private partnership and sometimes as strictly a private project. Um, it's important. Whatever the difference is, is important. It's legally important. In 2010, a law was passed in the Maine legislature without discussion um, that authorizes public-private partnerships for transportation projects. And guess what? If this turns out to be a public-private partnership, then that law kicks in. And in fact, last March, the commissioner of the Maine Department of Transportation um, at a public meeting described this as a public, you know, he said that a public-private partnership legislation is in place for this project. And in April, um, Peter Vigue, the principal promoter of the project, called this a public-private partnership in an interview in Maine Biz newspaper. Uh, and then another official in the Department of Transportation who's, in, who's working on this project uh, described this as a public-private partnership, uh, said that the law is being used for this project. Um, and then suddenly, um, when people were getting very alarmed about all of this last May, um, Peter Vigu at a huge public meeting in Dover Foscroft um, said this is not a public-private partnership. So what is it? All of these concerns um, add up to a lot of uh, angst, I'd say, about uh, the secrecy behind this project, the lack of transparency. We don't even know, they won't even tell us precisely what the route would be. Um, they've told us generally, but they say they don't, they don't want to tip their hand yet on the precise route because some landowners might try to speculate on that. Um, we don't know who's behind the project financially. They haven't said. Um, I already mentioned that we don't 
They haven't given us any substantive information about the impacts on the environment, on, on wetlands and water and air and forest and so forth. Um, at all of the so-called public meetings that have been held to date, th there has been no meaningful public input allowed. Um, the big meeting in Dover Foxcroft, for instance, uh, the public was not allowed to ask questions except by writing them down ahead of time and having them vetted um, by Chimbro, and most of them were not asked. Um, I talked about the uh, law that was passed for public-private partnerships. That law also, if it's used, which the DOT says it will be in this project, has a provision that blocks public requests under the state freedom of information statutes. So we can't even find out by filing a FOIA request what's going on. Um, also, you're not going to get a chance to vote on this. There's no statewide vote uh, on this project that will be coming up. Uh, and yet, as I said, $300,000 of public monies have been authorized for this private project. 